Good morning. Good to see you. How are your muscles doing? I, Olympics, you know, I had a crook in my neck when I went to bed, and, and I, watched a, I watched a relay this morning. My shoulders are aching. So, you know, you just kind of get into it, don't you? A few things we wanted to let you know this morning. I'm not David. You know that. Uh, John Watkin, and I'm, I'm pinch hitting for him today. Uh, the vegetables over here are not for you. <laughs> they are, I was told to tell you that. They are going to the Our Center to be distributed to people who need them even more than we do. And Sybil Gurner's service is at 11 o'clock on Saturday here in this place. And uh, if you would like to help with the potluck, there's still a sign-up sheet in the fellowship hall. You can go in there and do that. God bless you. Great to have you here at worship today. Good morning. Please stand as you are able and join me in the words of welcome, which are found on the screen. We gather this day, bringing with us our hopes and dreams, doubts and fears. Whether you're a visitor, guest, or friend, you are welcome here. If you are fighting disease or recovering from injury, suffering from pain or struggling mentally or emotionally, whatever your shame, your sorrow, your fears, your addictions, you are welcome here. Whether you're able to give generously of what you have or what you have is barely enough to keep yourself going each day, you are welcome here. Whether you follow Jesus or don't know Jesus, whether your views are conservative, progressive, or indifferent, you are welcome here. Whoever you are, wherever you are in your faith journey, will come alongside you to worship, to learn, and to join hands in working in the community. You are welcome here. In Christ's name, all are welcome here. Please join me in our opening prayer. Gracious God, we gather together on this day of worship to ask for your blessing. We gather together to ask that your will be made known. And gracious God, we gather together to sing praises to your holy name. Amen. Now let us join our voices in singing hymn number 63, The Lord is God. And the words are on, will be on the screen. As scripture tells us, if we think we are without sin, we are deceiving ourselves. God invites us into God's presence to unburden ourselves of the sins we carry with us. Please join me as we confess our sins to God using the words on the screen. Gracious God, Jesus tells us that our lives are enriched by loving you and loving our neighbors. We confess that love is hard for us. We are too selfish. We 
pessimistic, too hollow or too hardened, or just too tired to give ourselves to love's demands. Forgive our arrogance and our listlessness. Cleanse our hearts that we might find the strength to do what love requires and the grace to receive what love has to give. We pray in the name of Jesus, whose love has no boundary. Amen. Hear the good news. Who is in a position to condemn? Only Christ. And Christ died for us. Christ rose for us. Christ reigns in power for us. Christ prays for us. Anyone who is in Christ is a new creation. The old life has gone. A new life has begun. Know that you are forgiven and be at peace. Amen. Now, please join me as we pray for understanding. Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures are read and your word is proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you say to us today. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you. The Testament reading today is found in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 6, verses 4 through 9. It's found on page 163 in your pew Bibles and on the screen. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. Keep these words that I am commanding you today in your heart. Recite them to your children and talk about them when you are at home and when you are away, when you lie down and when you rise. Bind them as a sign on your hand, fix them as an emblem on your forehead, and write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
Somehow my paper clip got lost. <laughs> oh dear. Okay. I'm somewhere over in Luke. That was all the way to the back. I didn't have to do this for ordination like he did. <laughs> Come on, Luke. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Yeah. What is that you're supposed to remember? <laughs> you know. <laughs> Where did that thing go? There it is. My paper, but my... New Testament reading today, I finally found, is in Luke chapter 10, verses 25 through 37. Just then a lawyer stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, what is written in the law? What do you read there? He answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, you have given the right answer. Do this and you will live. But wanting to justify himself, he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell into the hands of robbers, who stripped him and beat him and went away, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, while traveling, came near him, and when he saw him, he was moved with pity. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, having poured oil and wine on them. Then he put him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper and said, take care of him and when I come back I will repay you whatever more you spend. Which of these two do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? He said, the one who showed him mercy. Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. The Good Samaritan story is found uh, only in Luke, but it's interesting when you look at it that the encounter between Jesus and the lawyer that led to the Good Samaritan story is also in Mark and Matthew. It's interesting that in Matthew and Mark, the lawyer asks the question, what is the greatest question? And Jesus answers with a great, com with a great command. In Matthew 22, 36 through 40, for instance, it says, Teacher, which commandment in the law is the greatest? Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment. And a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. That last verse kind of gets my attention. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. I believe that everything written in God's Word is hanging on these two commandments that Jesus gives. My parents were both the firstborn in their families. That meant that everything had a right way to be done. You didn't compromise, you didn't compromise on that at all. My mom was precise about how the table was set and how the bed was to be made. A dinner plate included a, a meat section and a vegetable section and a salad section. That was a, that was a balanced meal. Now the salad section was an elaborate thing that she did until she cooked no, no longer. It was a leaf of lettuce, a half a peach, a pear, or some kind of jello concoction, and then a dollop of white stuff in the middle of it. Uh, the white stuff was the adventure part. I wish they'd had Cool Whip in that day, but I don't think we did. My dad was precise about mowing the lawn. It had to be cross mowed. It had to be precisely edged. Remember, we were in Southern California, and 
if you didn't edge your lawn, you were just from the other side of the tracks or something, but, but you had to have it properly edged. I think that my, my main activity as a kid was to go to Dodger games with my dad, and I think he got caught up with the way that the, the field was maintained there, and we brought that home with us. He was also very precise about the church. I'm not just talking about the service order or the sermon or the administration of the church. As a kid, I remember watching him in the middle of the week walk up to the communion table, take out his handkerchief, and dust the table. My mother wasn't especially fond of that because she had to wash the handkerchief afterwards. And he was a lifelong picture straightener. Uh, he never owned a level. He actually didn't need it. The level was all in his head. In earthquake-prone California, there were many things that my dad could straighten. It was almost an endless uh, job for him. I, I watched him do it at home. I watched him do it in the church. I watched him in doctor's offices. I watched him in hospital waiting rooms, making sure the pictures were straight. As I was writing about this, I, I looked across the top of my computer and I saw the largest picture on the wall opposite me was crooked. I couldn't believe I had a crooked picture in my house. It was actually off by a quarter of a bubble on the level. So I lined it up and I found this sticky stuff years ago in an office supply store and I put it on the back of the picture and I pretty well glued it to the wall. I, I know that with my level and with my sticky stuff, my pictures hold firm in most earthquakes. I brought this to demonstrate to you that this hanging pictures level is no small thing to me. Uh, I had a secretary who watched me hang pictures forever at the church, and she finally gave this to me for Christmas, and it's one of my most treasured things. If you, if you want to know how to use it, I'll show you afterwards. I have, a, I have a demonstration. In fact, I could do a seminar on hanging pictures. <laughs> Believe it or not, my message today is not about hanging pictures. It's about balance in the great commandment. When I look at this, I see balance. If I had the old assayer scales, that might be better, but I see balance when I look at this. And when I get that bubble in the middle, I know I'm balanced. The great commandment is all about balance. Jesus gives to his followers the secret of balance. He says, love God, love your neighbor. It's the essential balance, I think, between worship and ministry, two words we use in the church all the time. Let me give you a few definitions. Worship is expressing your love to God, expressing your love to God. When you love God with all your heart, it means that those things that matter most to God also matter to you. God loves people, and he wants you to love people just like he does. He wants you to love your neighbor in the same way that you want to be loved by others. This is ministry. I like to use this definition. Ministry is meeting needs with love. Meeting needs with love. So loving your neighbor as yourself is what ministry is about. When God's love is working in you, it transforms you from self-centeredness to other-centeredness. Each time you reach out in love to others, you're ministering to them. You are equipped and used by God to meet spiritual, emotional, relational, and physical needs. Jesus said in John chapter 13, verse 35, By this everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Jesus didn't tell his disciples that he wanted them to be known for their preaching, or he wanted them to be known for their buildings, or that he wanted them to be known for how they dressed. But he wanted them to be known for their love for one another. Now the problem is that in our neighborhoods and even in our families, they include some pretty unsavory and some very difficult people. I'm serving on an HOA board in my community for the first time in my life, and I wish I wasn't. <laughs> it's tempting to avoid those that we find very hard to love. It's easier to stick with people who are much more like us. But God expects us to treat others exactly as we want to be treated. God expects us to show love to our neighbors 
no matter who they are. Jesus used the word love as a verb. It's an action word. Let's ask some key questions about neighbor love. He says, what does it mean to love myself? Loving your neighbor as yourself means that you do for them whatever you would do for yourself. I want to give a word of caution here. The love we're talking about will not be evident in your life if you don't have a positive self-love. I'm talking about the need to have an honest, positive view of yourself. I used to give an exercise to people when I did counseling before marriage. I asked them to give 10 characteristics about themselves, and I always looked to see what they gave me. Did they give me positive or negative characteristics? It was extremely rare for somebody to respond with 10 positive characteristics about themselves. That's often tough for us. Loving your neighbor as yourself must include the positive view of your own strengths and your own weaknesses. You're perfectly and wonderfully made. Scripture tells us that. Sometimes it's hard to believe it, isn't it? <laughs> I don't beat myself up or I don't hate myself because I have little mechanical ability. I'm lucky when I get into a car if I can find the dimmer switch for the headlights. You know, as part of my self-love, I, I recognize that God did not shape me for fixing cars, and I use a mechanic as a part of my self-love. Healthy self-esteem is important because some of us think too little of ourselves. On the other hand, some of us overestimate ourselves. Paul said in Romans 12, verse 3, Be honest in your estimate of yourselves measuring your value by how much faith God has given you. Loving yourself includes having faith in the forgiveness of God. God's forgiving love helps me to see my own value. And if we love our neighbors as ourselves, we need to forgive them for the wrongs they've done to us. That leads to the next observation. Who is my neighbor? God's concept of, of neighbor is broad, extending to the poor, the disenfranchised, even to the alien. For the first century Jew, your neighbor was another Jew. For the Pharisee, your neighbor was not only a Jew, but also a Jew who kept all the rules. That, they narrowed the definition of neighbor. Jesus knew that when he was talking about this. Luke's account of this encounter between Jesus and a religious lawyer really puts special emphasis on this love of neighbor. Because Luke was a Gentile, the story Jesus tells of the Good Samaritan helped him to know where he, as a non-Jew, fit into the whole thing. I think that's why Luke is the only one who included it. I believe that Jesus was doing more here than simply answering the who is my neighbor question. Let's look at the story itself. The man has been uh, on the edge of the crowd for a long time. He listens to Jesus with a mixture of response and inner objection. It's obvious that he's a religious lawyer or a scribe of the Mosaic law. His official robes declare his position. His attitude communicates a confident air of refined legalism. At the center of his forehead is a meticulously positioned phylactery, symbolizing his orthodox beliefs. This small black calfskin box is bound to him tightly with leather thongs. These two passages were written in very small letters on parchment and placed in that box. The first one that was read this morning, Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 5. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. And then Leviticus 19, 18. Love your neighbor as yourself. So as, as Jesus finishes what he's saying, perhaps he turns his gaze toward the lawyer. So the lawyer asked Jesus a question, a question that's calculated, that's challenging, that's biting. Verse 25, 
Teacher, he said, what must I do to have to inherit eternal life? The lawyer knew the answer before he asked. And Jesus is not unsettled by the question. In verse 26, Jesus carefully words his response with another question. Well, what is written in the law? What do you find there? The lawyer answered in verse 27, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. What he quotes from the law is inscribed right there in the, in the phylactery box that he has on his forehead. In verse 28, Jesus says, you've given the right answer. Then Jesus adds these words from, Levitic from Leviticus 18.5, do this and you will live. But this man had waited way too long for his opportunity with Jesus to be cut off so quickly. Verse 29 says, but wanting to justify himself, he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? With incredible patience, Jesus recasts the question and answers the one this man should have asked, not just who is my neighbor, but how should I act as a neighbor? You see, it's a balance or a level question. Imagine the crowd as Jesus tells the story of this man who was robbed, stripped, beaten, and left to die on the treacherous road from Jerusalem down to Jericho. Everyone in the crowd knows that this place was called the Bloody Way as the 22 mile road came to be known. It was a precarious road because of the robbers who hid in rocks and crevices and caves. No one was safe along this 30 foot, 3,500 foot descent to Jericho. The crowd listened intently as Jesus tells about the priest and the Levite who happened along the way, they find the man, they, they listen in anguish as Jesus says that the religious leaders pass by on the other side of the road. Imagine the lawyer's response, his internal response to that. And Jesus has made an impression with his illustration, but the lawyer's not really ready for the telling twist that follows as Jesus continues. But a Samaritan while traveling came near him and when he saw him, he was moved with pity. He went to him, bandaged his wounds, having poured oil and wine on them. Then he put him on his own animal, brought him to an inn and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper and said, take care of him when I come back, I will repay you whatever more you spend. Kind of a gasp rippled through the crowd at this time. The name the Samaritan, the name Samaritan completely invoked that. No one in the crowd, least of all the lawyer, expected that turn in this parable. Everyone following the story expected an Israelite to be the third character. Of all the substitutes for Israelite in his story, Jesus could not have startled the crowd anymore and the lawyer any more than his use of the hated word Samaritan. The Jews truly hated the Samaritans. The, the animosity had been handed down from generation to generations. Ever since the defeat of the Northern Kingdom in, 70, in 722 BC, when many Jews were dragged off to ex exile in Babylonia. Those who remained intermarried with the Assyrians who were brought in to populate and occupy the land they became half-breeds and hated by the Jews. After the exile, the Samaritans offered to help Zerubbabel rebuild the temple. The Jews felt such strong antagonism that they refused the help and the hostility just intensified through the years. No wonder there was shock and anguish in this crowd when a Samaritan is made the surprise hero of this story. No one's more disturbed than the lawyer he asked, who is my neighbor? And Jesus used a half-breed as an example of what it means to be a neighbor. Now, like all of the other parables, what, what happens here is that, is that this story has a single central theme or thought about God. The point here is that God's love is spontaneous. It's unqualified. It's never limited by the rules of religion. 
Jesus himself was the spontaneous, incarnate love of God. In effect, Jesus tells his own story in the parable. The world he came to save was a Jericho road, and his response to human suffering was marked by spontaneity. This is a parable of contrasts. Jesus wants us to see and feel the spontaneous love of the Samaritan in contrast to the calculated neglect and qualified concern of the priest and Levite. As we read this parable, we're challenged to put ourselves in the parable. This story is of the wounded and the wounders and the kind of wound healers we are to be. The wounded are all around us. There are those who have been debilitated physically, psychologically, socially, by no fault of their, uh, of their own. We can't read this parable without asking, well, who is the wounded person on the road for me? He or she may be in our own family, maybe among our friends at work or in church or in our community. We can be wounders or wound healers in our relationship with them. One day I received a phone call from my friend Dave up in Estes Park. He said, uh, are you doing anything tomorrow? Normally that is, do you want to come up and take pictures? But I sensed something different in this conversation. I said, well, what do you need? He then told me that his wife Kim was having foot surgery on Wednesday and he was wondering if I could come up and help him get her from the car to the house. You know, my mind quickly calculated, well, that's, that's a 45 minute to an hour drive and 10 minutes and another 45 to an hour minute drive back home. I'm really fast about calculating that. You know, and I, and I, I, and I, I said, uh, well, is there anybody else that can help you? And he really, uh, he really didn't know of anybody else. He suddenly realized, I'm this guy's only friend to do something practical like that. And, I, and, I, and he said, well, maybe there's somebody that I can get to help me. So I, I, I said, well, see if they can do it. If not, then I'll come up. God truly has a sense of humor. <laughs> After I hung up the phone, uh, it got me right here. I was quickly aware that I just moved to the opposite side of the road like the priest and the Levite. I called Dave back and I told him we'd be there at 10 o'clock on Wednesday morning. Now Dave lives on the side of a hill. He has, a very challenging, he has very challenging steps and he really did need our help and we were glad to do it. But his request confronted me with my own balance issue. What was, was, was two hours of travel and 10 minutes of work or whatever? Was that more? Did I have to do anything more important than that? No, but my reply to him had been out of balance. The contrast of the priest of the Levite with the Samaritan could not have been more pointed, more startling. Look at what the Samaritan did. Scripture says he went to him, he used wine and oil to administer first aid. He personally bandaged his wounds. He put the bloody man on his own donkey. He took him to an inn. He cared for him perhaps all night long. He gave the innkeeper two denarii or about 40 cents in our money, which was the equivalent of two days pay for a day laborer. Listen to the final instructions to the innkeeper. Take care of him and when I come back, I will repay you whatever more you spend. This indicates that he's not done. He's coming back to check on the wounded man, to settle up with the innkeeper. The Samaritan completely fulfilled Leviticus 19.18 portion of that summary of the law. He loved his neighbor as himself. Healthy self-love enabled him to care about this man. Meanwhile, back to the lawyer. <laughs> now Jesus is asking the questions. The lawyer tried to interrogate Jesus, but now he's being interrogated. Jesus has won the dispute here. And in verses 10 through 37, he says, 
Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? He said, the one who showed him mercy. Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. Suddenly we feel what the lawyer must have felt. The admonition is for us as followers of Jesus, we are called into demanding, challenging, but a very exciting go and do likewise kind of spontaneous love. The wounded of the world are now our agenda. Wounding people with neglect is never acceptable. Are we willing to put aside our judgments, our exclusivism, our fear of involvement, our privacy, our schedules, our time to be available for the coincidences, the, the God things that will happen constantly for those of us who are willing? question is very current. It's common to hear people hear voices of protest in our country when we reach out to another country that's hurting. The question is always asked, well, why are we helping them when we have needs here at home? That's a who is my neighbor question. Our love for God inspires and requires us to love one another. Our love for God taps us into a great big neighborhood, a worldwide neighborhood. I know that living life is a whole lot more difficult than hanging a picture. We've all got areas where we're half a bubble off level or more. <laughs> but I also know that God provides the strength and the wisdom to find a better balance in our own lives. It's my prayer that we will learn to love God with everything we have and that as we love God, His Holy Spirit will empower us to love others in a way that will bring peace to the very least in our world. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, I pray that we would each personally make a great commitment to the great commandment to love God and to love others. I'm really praying that we would grow in our love relationship with you. Because as we do, we will better understand how much you love us and the people of this world that you created. Thank you for sending your only son into this world so that we could know your forgiveness and peace. May we be committed to pass it on by sincerely loving our neighbors with the love you have poured out on us. Show us the practical things that we can easily do and give us courage to do the difficult things you have planned. Father, open our eyes to see the people of our world and the problems of this world from your perspective. I pray this in Jesus' name, amen. We've heard the word preached. We've heard it proclaimed. In response, let's stand and join our voices in singing hymn number 771, What is the World Like?
people said. Amen. You may be seated. I love the text of that song. I don't see any ushers, but I think they're supposed to come down right now <laughs> and receive our Sunday morning tithes and offerings. Lord, we thank you for the privilege of giving today. We thank you for the, the jobs that you've given to us. And Lord, we thank you for the opportunities we have in this community. We pray that you would use these gifts and guide us in their spending. We give you praise today. Amen. You may be seated. As we come to our time of prayer this morning, I invite you to take all of those things that are on your hearts and your minds as we go to God in prayer. Please join me. Gracious and loving God, we are thankful to be here this morning in your presence. We have the opportunity that we sometimes can take for granted. But we have this freedom and this opportunity to be here together to worship you, to praise you, to lift your name high and to celebrate all the many blessings that you have given to each and every one of us. We are thankful for that. Love is a hard thing. Love is one of those things that we dream of, of finding that person to love, to care about us, to care so we can care about them. But love is hard. Love has to start with love of ourselves, as John spoke about. Self-love. And that can be difficult. But when we can love ourselves as you love us, then we can in turn love your world. It's easy to love those that we know. And even those people that we know that are kind of hard to love, but we at least are trying to figure that out. But when we come across situations that we disagree with, 
that are hard and challenging, that are hurtful, extending your love to those folks is a true challenge. Lord God, we ask that you will be with us, that you will help us to stop and listen and look into your world and know that we are not going to agree with every situation. But Lord God, we can continue to share your love in the world. We can care for one another in disagreement. We can help one another even when it goes against what we think. Lord God, you have made each of us. You have given us strengths. We have some weaknesses as well. But help us to look inside ourselves and find those things that challenge us about ourselves because often, Lord God, those are the things that we find difficult to understand in others. Help us to realize your love binds us all together your love lifts us into a place that is better. And as we love one another around our little neighborhood, there are neighborhoods around this world that we can care about, that we can help, that we can build up, even when it's difficult. Lord God, we lift all of those cares and concerns that are on our hearts this morning and ask that you are in those situations, that you are with those people who are needing healing, who are needing extra measures of love and mercy today. And for those people who have joys in their lives, help them to just see the full beauty of all that they are experiencing, whatever it may be, Lord God. We ask that you are with us in our steps as we move forward out of this place today that you will give us courage and boldness to meet your world in whatever way we may. We know that you are guiding us and that you are encouraging us and that you are giving us strength when we need it. But most of all, Lord God, you are shining your light and your love into our world and into each of us. And we thank you and we ask that you will continue to lead us with that. We ask all these things in your name, and we pray together now the prayer that you taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I invite you to stand now and join me as we sing our closing song, Take My Life and Let It Be. It's a little different tune than you might be expecting.
No, cha cha cha. <laughs> I, I knew you wouldn't get that. <laughs> Let's say the prayer of St. Francis together. It's up there on those beautiful new screens. It's coming. It's going to happen. There it is. Let's say it together. Lord, make us instruments of your peace. Where there is hatred, help us to show love. Where there is injury, help us to be agents of healing. Where there is doubt, help us to live faith. Where there is despair, help us to give hope. Where there is darkness, help us to be light. Where there is sadness, help us to share joy. Lord, grant that we may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive. It is in pardoning that we are pardoned. It is in dying that we are born to eternal life. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all now and forevermore. Amen. Amen. <laughs>